Of all the house-made Penske's that have raced in IndyCar, one stands above the rest in my opinion as being the strangest. Built in the UK, driven by two Americans and two Brazilians, and raced across two years where the results range from amazing to horrible, it's fair to say that this car's life was bizarre. So from the results on track to the design and the people behind the car itself, I'm here today to tell this car's story. Today, I tell the story of the Penske PC27, the strangest Penske chassis. Entering the 1998 kart season, Penske was struggling with their own car. Cars. The previous year's PC26 was fast on the ovals but horrendous on the road courses. Paul Tracy was very vocal with his disdain of the car, as it was his car's lack of pace on road courses that sent Tracy from championship contender to mid-pack pawn. In a mid-season test during the 97 season, Tracy had actually gone far quicker in a Raynard than he did in the Penske chassis, so when asked later that day about advice for improvements to be made towards next year's chassis, Tracy said something to the effect of just get the Raynard. Comments that eventually led to Tracy's fire at season's end. Simply put, Tracy was fired because he didn't like the Penske cars, and I don't think that's an unfair statement. It was Team Penske's delusional outlook on the competitiveness of their cars that sealed their fate, with Tracy's win at Gateway during the 97 season being the last win for Team Penske in the 1990s. I've already made a video about Tracy's topsy-turvy 97 season, so check that out if you feel so inclined. The new car for the 98 season would see significant changes, as it was said the only part carried over from the PC26 was just the wheel bearings. Overall, the PC26 was not a good race car, but from a results perspective at least, it was a masterpiece compared to the PC27. But before we get into that, let's take a glossary look at the car's design. Let's start the front of the car, and that interesting nose. Unlike most cars at the time with wings attached directly to the nose cone, this design was more akin to something you'd see in Formula 1. The long sort of shark fin connecting the wing assembly to the nose was an odd design choice, and the first time I saw this, I made the F1 connection almost immediately. Immediately. Moving further back to the actual chassis, and the shape of the monocoque seemed very different too. The top of the chassis looked a bit more bulky than the other cars, seeming more like a rectangle with rounded off edges and the more rounded off design you'd see up and down the cart grid at the time. Again, very Formula 1-esque in the car's look so far. Things don't get any better moving farther down the car. The sides of the cockpit were a tad higher than the other cars. It definitely wasn't a massive change, but it was a change nevertheless. But one of the biggest changes was a lack of a dorsal, or a somewhat call it a shark fin. IndyCars had that kind of shark fin designed for years up to this point, and it was a very big difference. In terms of things internally, the car had a longitudinally placed transmission, and a much smaller Mercedes engine compared to the year prior. At about 2.3 liters, it was actually the smallest engine ever run in car to that point. As such, the car was about 40 pounds lighter than its predecessor, and about 4.5 inches shorter too. These changes certainly made the car stand out, but change isn't always a good thing. The design philosophy across the board was more like an F1 car than an Indy car, sharing absolutely nothing with its predecessor or its competition. It was a gamble, a very big gamble at that, but this contemporary European design car didn't fit the series very well. So who are the people behind this car? Firstly, we have the car's designer, a man named John Travis. Travis had an interesting history in and out of racing to this point. In the early days, Travis was a driver himself, racing in various Formula series for his own outfit, Blackgate Racing Developments. During this time, he was a full-time engineer as well, working in the British aerospace industry. But as Travis's racing adventures as a driver came to an end, he began designing his own cars for other racers. Soon enough, he'd end up at Lola, working on their F3000 program at first before joining the IndyCar side of things later on. He worked as the chief designer for the Lola IndyCar program from 1994 to 1996, where their performances immediately took a hit. Compared to 8 wins in 1993, 94 saw Lola grab just one win. Things would pick up in the next two years, where Lola grabbed 12 wins, 495, and 8 in 96. It was during 96 when John left Lola for Penske, and it would be the PC27 that would be his first car for the team, and it was a pretty shocking start to his time with the team. Speaking of shocking starts with the team, Andre Ribeiro was new to the team that year, and would have a year so horrible he was essentially chewed up and spat out of the sport by season's end. Al Unser Jr., meanwhile, actually liked the car. He liked the way it looked and enjoyed the experience with the gearbox, but this newfound confidence didn't convert the best on track. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the car's results. 
Unser certainly had a far better year than his teammate, with Unser grabbing 7 top 10s, 4 top 5s, and 2 podiums, with his best result being a 2nd place run of the 2nd race of the season in Motegi. But outside those 7 top 10s, Unser only finished 3 more races. Of 9 DNFs, 6 of them were down to mechanical issues, with the other 3 being crashes. It's also ironic how despite Unser's praise, 2 of his DNFs were down to gearbox troubles. In terms of pace, Unser started in the midfield more often than not, with his highest start that year being in the US 500 where he started 4th. Unser had an average start of 13.3, and finished 11th in the points. Ribeiro meanwhile had a torrid time, so much so that I plan to cover this season at great length in the not too distant future. Ribeiro finished no better than 7th, and while his qualifying was fast at times, it was about as consistent as expired mayonnaise. Ribeiro also had a lot of DNFs, 9 to be exact, with a staggering 5 of them being linked to transmission issues. Ribeiro ended 1998 22nd in points, the lowest points finish of any full time Penske driver in the team's history. Ribeiro was dropped for the following year, and speaking of which, for 1999, Penske's driver lineup would be El Anser Jr. full time, and the likes of Tarzo Marquez, Alex Barron, and Gonzalo Rodriguez making starts as well. The PC27 would be updated for 99, now being referred to as a 27B, but the changes in the offseason arguably made the car even worse, which forced Penske's hand in using the car sparingly and finally starting to use customer cars throughout the year. The 27B raced only 14 times that season, with Unser making 7 starts, Marquez making 5, and Baron making only 2. The results this year were pretty dreadful, with a 7th place finish for Unser and a 9th for Marquez being the only top 10s for the car that season. The car also failed to finish 8 times, and after the season finale in Fontana, the Penske chassis program was dropped, meaning the PC27 was retired for good. So what happened for this car's legacy to be what it is? Well, that really depends on who you ask. Al Jr. blamed it on the puny Mercedes engine package, which was one of the slowest at the time, and Goodyear tires. He said that the car could have easily been a success had they run Firestones and a Honda engine. But as far as I'm concerned, there are four more things that did this car in. Firstly, the car's design was done with a wrong philosophy. It tried to take inspiration from F1, and that was just a wrong way of going about things. The movie Driven was originally meant to be about F1, but they settled for IndyCar instead, and look how that went. That's basically how this car came to be, and I think having a mindset for a completely different series doomed this car from the start. It also doesn't help that the Mercedes engine and Goodyear tire programs were poor as well. They were backburner programs, as Mercedes focused more on F1, and Goodyear focused more on NASCAR. It also doesn't help that the driver situation wasn't good at Penske either. Unser hadn't won a race since 1995, and he was very clearly past his prime, but he was still the best driver at the team's disposal. Boiling the PC27's issues to just one thing is difficult, impossible even, because it was just an avalanche of issues both self-inflicted and accidental that doomed this car from the very beginning. Despite his first car being a total failure, John Travis would continue working with Penske until 2002, when after Penske's bid to once again build their own chassis was rejected, Travis was fired. He would then bounce around from company to company, working on a failed LMP1 venture, and later with the A1 GP series. As of now, he works as a technical director for a company specializing in luxury powerboats, and has no real connections to the racing world. As for the PC27s, there's still a few laying around, some in museums, others in personal collections, but all serving as reminders of a very strange and very flawed race car. Thank you for watching, and have a great afternoon.